also okay. Russ is trying to get a white guy once we see it. We gotta find this. You see that? Yeah. All right. Kind of a dull orange color, but it looks like a bright ember from a fireplace. And it's obvious that this hunk of nightlight is actually salt. Well, that sure made you quiet and hurt. <laughs> it's an enormous salt crystal that's gathered from deep under ocean waters. And they come in and collect these salt chunks and wire them, but they admit this light boasts of the salt crystal's ability to simultaneously soothe and energize based on the positive ions that the crystal gives off when it's worn by the electric light within it. You all feel that energy? energy. <laughs> feel like the bunny? You know, that may, of course, simply be some shinola added to the shine of the product, but no matter, it's physically therapeutic value as a gleaming, solid, comforting nightlight in the dark. The big rock salt crystal offers plenty of emotional <coughs> therapy. The warmth of its friendly, substantial glow makes any nightlight foray less frightening. It's kind of neat to look at. This odd nightlight combines two tremendous images of strength and steadfastness, of power and perpetuity. Salt, in ancient times, symbolized staying power. Salt was the great preservative, the only way to keep food from spoiling. The only way to lay up provisions for harsh and hungry days ahead. Because salt was identified with keeping things fresh and, and viable, it also became linked with the eternal unwavering steadfastness and steadiness of God's covenant with Israel. In fact, the promise Yahweh made Israel was a, a covenant of salt. Leviticus 2.13 says, Season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. It would never spoil or grow old. It's always fresh, nourishing, life-sustaining. In temple rituals of sacrifice, it was mandated every burnt offering be seasoned with salt. Illustrating the eternal nature of the bond between God and the people. Each time an offering was made on the altar. Salt is really a good symbol of God's activity in, our per in a person's life. Because it penetrates, preserves, and aids healing. God wants to be active in your life and my life. He seeks to become part of our lives. Penetrating every aspect of our life, preserving us from the evil all around. And healing us of our sins and our shortcomings. That the uh, sacrificial practice and image of temple worship combined the persistence of salt with the power of fire. The magic and wonder of something as, as simple and as earth-shattering as fire is sometimes overlooked by the 21st century high-tech urban and urbane Americans. Two events this past summer, however, combined to remind us of all the honest, all-consuming nature of fire. Remember in the news in the West, firepower was demonstrated by the series of unprecedented wildfires. Housing developments in Arizona and whole cities in British Columbia were wiped out by wind-wet flames of forest fires that became city fires. In Oregon, the state was kind of severed in half. The main pass over, uh, the, the main pass over the Cascade Mountains, dividing the green, moist, western Half of the state, from the eastern dry, high desert side of the state, was completely closed for two weeks. But even as the drought, high temperatures, and windswept fires kept raging in the west, the fires in the east went out completely. If you don't think you're dependent on fire, think again. Because our flames today have another name called. Electricity. All the things human beings used for fire over millennia were transferred to the carefully contained 
Fire that jets and jolts down the power lines and across the power grids of first world countries. When flames were used to bring us light and heat, to cook our food and warm our homes, we now have the incandescent flicker of electric fire. If the power is on and the switch is thrown. <laughs> the Orthodox rabbi recognized this connection, transcending the ancient prohibition of kindling a fire on a Sabbath into the 20th century ban on kindling electric lights in power. Just as no observant Jew would have built a fire to cook or light candles to see by, so 21st Orthodox Jews don't turn on a stove or flick a light switch. We've had some real problems in our history with this fire electricity. My oldest sister, Yvonne, was a member of our church youth fellowship in high school that took a trip to New York City in 1965. You remember what happened in 1965? While there, they experienced a dust money meet the biggest power failure in U.S. history, as all of New York State and portions of seven neighboring states and parts of eastern Canada were plunged in the darkness. The great Northeast blackout began at the height of rush hour, delaying millions of commuters, trapping 800,000 people in New York subways, and stranding thousands more in <coughs> buildings and elevators and trains. 10,000 National Guard and 5,000 off-duty police officers were called in to serve to prevent looting. That blackout was caused by the tripping of a 230 kilovolt transmission line near Ontario, Canada at 5.16 p.m. that evening, which caused several other heavily laden and loaded power lines to fail. And this precipitated a surge of power that overwhelmed the transmission lines in western New York, causing a cascading tripping of additional lines, resulting in the eventual break of the entire northeastern transmission network. Altogether, 30 million people in eight U.S. states and the Canadian provinces of Ontario and Quebec were affected by the blackout. And during the night, power was gradually restored to most of the blackout areas. And by morning, it all been restored in the Northeast. But this wasn't the only time there would be a problem like this. Because another outage happened on August 14th of 2003 at 4.10 p.m. And this was the second biggest blackout ever to hit the U.S., plunging the entire northeastern to midwestern portions of the country into darkness. This is also the second largest worldwide blackout with widespread outage. Next to the outage in southern Brazil in 1999. <coughs> Most people had their power on by 11 p.m. that night. Others didn't get their power restored for almost two weeks. The outage, which was more widespread than the Northeast blackout of 65, as the one affected an estimated 10 million people in Ontario and 45 million in eight U.S. states. And this blackout, the primary cause was a software bug. And the alarm system in the control room of First Energy Corporation, located in Akron, Ohio, <laughs> caused an operator to remain unaware of the need to redistribute the load over, over, uh, across overloaded transmission lines that had drifted into foliage. What should have been a manageable local blackout cascaded into a collapse of the entire grid electrical system. Without our firepower, there were no traffic lights. Traffic ground to a halt for two days in New York City. Air conditioners were, were mourned and missed the first couple of days. The second day, when things like water and food took on a more immediate importance. Climbing downstairs to the sixth floor might have been bad, but being trapped in a dark, sweltering subway, installed elevators, was worse. As inconvenient and frustrating as a massive power outage was for most, for some having to, the, pub, the plug pulled, was a matter of life and death. Hospitals equipped with huge backup generators were swamped with respiratory outpatient care patients who had their breathing 
machine suddenly silenced the electric one out. They depended on 21st century firepower for every life-sustaining breath they took. In today's gospel, Jesus continues to try and teach his followers what true discipleship means, especially what true discipleship may cost. At the heart of Jesus' lesson is a message that discipleship means service to others, sacrifice for the sake of others. Privilege and power, rank and honor do not make up the resume of a true disciple of Christ. It's only in service to others, Jesus insists, it's only in working for others that any glimpse of glory may be attained. In verse 41, he says, a task as simple as assuming and uh, uh, unassuming as giving a cup of water and drink to one who bears the name of Christ is revealed as a kind of action that may ultimately gain a servant, disciple, a reward. But Jesus doesn't paint a rosy portrait of genuine discipleship. Following the way of true service may require significant sacrifice on the part of the would-be followers. Do whatever it takes Jesus cautions in today's text to keep yourself and your actions from being roadblocks instead of street signs along the path of faith. Jesus' suggestions are shocking. In order to be a, a genuine disciple, he warns, we must be willing to sacrifice our whole self to the task of mission. Verse 42 to 48. Better than a disciple be drowned by a millstone around his neck maimed or blind, that to have their actions cause another fledgling follower to stray and be lost. But Jesus doesn't end on such a dismal and dramatic note. Instead, he makes a promise to all would-be disciples, to all who are willing to struggle against selfishness and offer themselves up to the service in Christ's name. At the end of today's lesson, verse 49, Jesus proclaims that everyone will be salted with fire, a reference to both the strength and steadfastness of any disciple's source of power. Those who commit themselves to Jesus, those who bear the name of Christ, are promised that both the staying power of salt and the surviving power of fire will be theirs throughout their life. If you've been salted by fire, you can never lose the sharpness and freshness of your faith nor can ever be quenched the warmth and power of God's presence in your life.